Okay, great. Everyone can hear me? Thank you so much for attending tonight. We'll be studying chapter number two. So I just first want to greet everyone and I want to thank you, even though we're in the tropical, tropical depression, we're still able to study the word because we're online, Diva. It's so nice. We don't have any reason to, the weather will not, there's no more absent, uh, absences for uh, uh, the weather. We will always have attendance. <laughs> Stick around though. All right, let's go ahead and open in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for tonight. We just want to give you, again, all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. You are all powerful. We submit to your will. We look at the weather. We look at uh, na natural catastrophes. We look at viruses. We look at all these uh, powerful forces of nature, uh, the stars, comets, the universe. And we, re we recognize that even though man has progressed so much, we, we are just ants compared to you, Father God. And so we want to submit to you tonight. We want to exalt your name, the name of your son. May you be glorified. I ask that you would speak through me and that these words would not be my words, but your words through the Holy Spirit. I pray that those things that are wrong would not be remembered, but those things that are truth, that they would not only be remembered, but they would be applied. And Father God, tonight as we study your word, we just, we're just uh, going to be focusing upon the great assurances of our salvation and also the call to action as uh, followers of your son, those who are in union with your son. And so Father God, I just pray now that as we study your word, that we would both have assurance and at the same time, we'd have a, a desire and a call to action to, to serve you faithfully, to be led by your spirit. In Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things through faith alone by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so we'll just do a quick introduction to the class, and then we'll get into the text. I have lofty goals tonight, so we'll see what happens. Lord willing, we can get through chapter 8. We're, we're going to be looking more at a, a bird's eye view. We're not going to be going into the details. The last two weeks, we really went, we just looked at two verses, and we, we went very deep. T tonight will be like an overview. So uh, tonight we'll be discussing uh, chapter two, A Sure Thing from Christianity 101 of the IT curriculum. And again, just to review our learning approach, we are going to be learning knowledge. So we're going to be working, using things to, that we're going to apply and recall in our minds. We're also going to take that knowledge and apply it to our hearts. And so with, whatever knowledge we gain as we study the word of God, we, we always want to we want to move it from here to here. And then um, we're, as we apply it in our heart, we're then able to apply it into Christian life, so as an individual. So we have to be holy. We have to be loving ourselves before we can love, love others, before we can teach others, before we can minister. So we want this heart change, this heart application, and then we want, we want to use our hands. So we want to apply the knowledge gained in the life of the church. And so uh, this is the I-Team curriculum. And so tonight, as we study the word of God, I don't want you just to be like, wow, that's a profound truth. You know, I'm amazed. Uh, and then leave and do nothing with it. I want you to apply it in your own heart. And then I also want you to apply it in the context of the church, in your neighborhoods, and in your communities. Format for the course for tonight, uh, we're going to have, I'm sorry, format for the course in general, not for tonight. We have lecture, which will be tonight, the homework, which we'll talk about later, and then also group meetings. So don't forget to meet with your group to discuss chapter two. And if you want, you can also discuss the lecture from tonight. And then also don't forget to be reaching out or talking to your mentor. And so just building that relationship, um, uh, giving them updates on what you're doing and plan, plan to meet once every two months. Okay, so overview for tonight, overview for tonight. So we're going to be looking at the primary objective for chapter number two is assurance of salvation, assurance of salvation. And our goal is to be familiar with the concept of assurance of salvation. The assurance of salvation, there's, there's many different texts that speak to assurance of salvation. There's many different types of assurances of salvation that we have. Some are more fundamental, um, others are, are, are less, but 
uh, nonetheless, there's a, a lot of different ways that we can have assurance of salvation. And so our goal is not to be comprehensive. Our goal is not to be really thorough and deep. Uh, we want you to be familiar. Uh, we want you to be familiar with what we learned tonight. Um, there's much more that you can learn beyond this. And so the primary text that we will be looking at is Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 8, verses 1 to 39. So <laughs> we're going to try. It, we're, we're skipping sections. I will read the full chapter. It's going to take some time, but um, the Word of God is quick and sharp and powerful. And, um, and so we are going to read the full chapter, but we'll just be touching on, on highlights. Just, so yeah, so we'll be, we'll be looking at a bird's eye view at different parts of chapter 8. But chapter 8 is probably... John Piper says Romans chapter 8 is the most important chapter in the entire Bible. So <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not. That's a strong statement. It could be. Uh, it, is very found, it's, it is very foundational for us. It's, it's very powerful. So I, I hope and trust that you'll see that as we, we continue tonight. Um, and so uh, we, ask, we want to be asking the primary question. So there's going to be so, there's so much information uh, there's so much information in Romans chapter 8, but we're just focusing on one question, actually two questions. Uh, what are the assurances of salvation according to Romans chapter 8? So there's so many different questions we could ask. We could spend months studying Romans chapter 8, okay, but we're not, we're focusing on this one specific question. What are the assurances of salvation according to Romans chapter 8? And then I want to get more specific in that question. The, the question I want to ask is, what is the greatest assurance of our salvation? So we're looking at different assurances of salvation, and then specifically, what is, according to Romans chapter 8, what is the greatest assurance of our salvation? And there, there, will, there will be clues as we work through the text that you might see. By the end, I hope that you will really see it. So, so this is our focus for Romans chapter 8. Uh, the assignment for next week, answer all the blanks for... Chapter 3 of I-Team, Course Christianity 101. Answer all the, break, the blanks. Now, uh, I actually forgot to, to prepare. I, I posted documents. I forgot to, to prepare to discuss them. I think if I discussed them tonight, we would not have time to go through Romans chapter 8. Um, uh, so maybe at the end we can talk. I do need to start recording our attendance and the assignments. So... Um, after, after we, we have a lecture, we need to discuss about for attendance because we're officially, we are officially teaching a curriculum, so I need to be record keeping. It's going to become so bad later <laughs> when we're looking for papers everywhere. So we, we have to get on top of that. So after, after class, let's discuss about getting caught up. Uh, this is the third week, so getting caught up with, with the record keeping um, for our, for our uh accreditation with PCEC so that we can, we can get the, we can get the certificate for those who are taking it for credit. Um, also meet with your group if you can this week and then prepare questions that you may have for next, for next week. Um, so that's, that's the assignment. Let's go ahead and get into the word of God. Let's go to Romans chapter, Romans chapter eight, verse one, Romans chapter eight, verse one. You'll see it on the screen here. I'll give you a moment to find it in your Bibles, Romans chapter 8. So we, I'm going to read the whole chapter. I'm, I will try to read it slowly. Um, if your English is not so good, I would encourage, don't try to read. If, if the reading is helpful, that's great, but just try to listen. Just try to listen. And, and if you want to read, that's fine too. But sometimes for me, it's better sometimes for me just to listen. So. Don't feel like you have to follow along in your Bible. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 to 39. Thus says the word of the Lord. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of flesh, and for sin he condemned sin in the flesh. 
in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Because those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God or against God, because it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but are in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if we live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are indeed children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, provided that we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility or worthlessness, destruction, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage of corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we Eagerly wait for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together, together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the first for, firstborn of many brothers. And those who are predestined, he also called. And those who he, he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did, did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things. Who shall bring a charge against the elect? God's elect. It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, he was raised. He, he is at the right hand of God. He is indeed interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation? Distress? persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword, as it is written, for your sake, 
we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Wow, <laughs> so strong. Oh my goodness. Um, I hope as I read through the passage, you were seeing some assurances. I hope you were seeing some assurances and some are more foundational than others. And there's many of them. So what we're going to do now is, um, let's go ahead and get into the word and we are just going to work through this I, I typically always run out of time, so I really want to apologize if we do not get through this. If it's two weeks, then it's good because this is, I mean, this is so important. If, if the last two weeks were the most important, this is the, the next most important. Um, so let's go ahead. Let's look here at Romans chapter one. And uh, uh, what I want to draw your attention to is uh, this uh, this first statement, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Okay. Um, you have this, this conjunction, which is connecting back to the previous context. So this is really connecting back to Romans chapter 1, verses 15, Romans chapter 7, verse... 25, my, my, my apologies there. So this is a, a massive, uh, this is bringing Romans to a climax. The, the, the absolute climax, the, the pinnacle in Romans, the summit is Romans chapter 11. But this is on the way to the top. <laughs> this is on the way to the top. <laughs> so so there's, this, there's, a, there's been all of these, statements this argument built on what is the gospel what is the benefits of the gospel how are we supposed to respond to the gospel and so now paul is going to describe for us uh life in christ jesus okay and so what we have here is this massive declaration this is so foundational to us this is a declaration and in this declaration um this is a. Uh, This is describing a state. So there's no action, but it's describing a state of being, uh, existence, okay? What is in existence? What, what is the state and, and who's involved in this state, okay? We have, we have, a, we have the, these people here. And then we also have this, this statement, uh, no condemnation. So the state is that there's no condemnation, for, and then there's, a, there's people that it's related to, okay? So um, this would be the subject. And when I say there's no condemnation, what word, anyone can answer, what word comes to mind? When we think about condemnation, what's another word? What's a synonym? What's a similar word for condemnation? Anyone can call out. Condemnation. Damnation. Okay, damnation, yes. That's, that's true. Excellent, Pastor Noli. What's another word? So damnation, it's, it's in a similar context. So you're condemned, and when you're condemned, you, in, in a Christian context, you're damned. Okay, that's damnation. So the, the two are hand in hand. What, what's another word? What's another word uh, related to condemnation? What's another big word? It's Punishment. Yes. Okay, punishment. punishment, yes. Punishment? Great. Again, in, in this context of where there's condemnation, there's this punishment, there's damnation. Damnation is the, could be the punishment. So I'm thinking of, from our study from Romans chapter 1, 
what was one of the big words that we studied? What's, what's one of the, the big words or big concepts we talked about concerning the gospel, concerning salvation? In relationship to this word, it's a synonym. Anyone else want to take a stab? What about judgment? This word here is, uh, it's in this uh, judgment context. When we looked at Romans chapter 3, verses 10 to 20, the conclusion was all flesh will stand guilty and accountable to God. We, we talked about, about who is God. He's the creator. He's also the judge. In Romans chapter 2, it talks about uh, his uh um, his, his judgment's coming. On that judgment day, that final day, there's going to be wrath and fury poured out, okay? So um, condemnation, condemnation is the, the judgment that the, that the judge, uh, that's the verdict, okay? So what happens here is that in Romans, everything is pointing to this last judgment, this final judgment day where the wrath's going to be poured out, okay? Um, what, what Paul is saying here is when, when we're declared justified, so Romans chapter 5, 1, uh, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God, okay? That final judgment has been brought into the present, and the verdict has been not guilty, okay? So what, be, what is being stated here is that final condemnation or that final vindication is brought into the present. And what Paul is saying is, there is now. This is the time, the time reference. There is now no condemnation for who? <laughs> who is the ones that have no condemnation? Uh, we could talk about this as being, uh, let me just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change this here. With reference to who? Who are the ones who are the ones who have are in a state of no condemnation or in a state of righteousness? Who are the ones? Tell according to this passage, who are the ones? Those who believe in Christ Jesus' work. Good good answer, uh, Kuya Henry. So explicitly, explicitly. Now here, there's no mention of belief, but, but Kuya Henry is absolutely correct because in Romans chapter 1, we discussed about how the way that you are brought into uh, Romans chapter 1 and then also Romans chapter 3, we're brought in, into union with Christ by faith. So he, Pastor Henry is, uh, Kuya Henry is correct that it's those who believe, but um, uh, he also stated in Christ, in Christ. Does everyone see this here? This is a reference to union with Christ. The reason why there is no damnation, of course we're believing in Jesus, but the reason why, logically, the reason why there is no condemnation is because when God looks at us, we talked about this, and he, he goes to bang the gavel, he says, not guilty, because he doesn't see us, he sees his son. He sees Christ. Okay? So, so the number one assurance of our salvation that we know that we will not be condemned on the final day, right? Because the judgment, the, 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 the verdict has been brought into the present, but that final judgment day has not yet appeared. How we know is... Our union with Christ. Assurance number one. Assurance number one. Union with Christ. So th that, that might be a, a strange idea. What is union with Christ? We talked about this last week, but I'm just going to give you uh, a roughly parallel example. Think of marriage. with Christ. Very practical. Very practical. 
very practical, okay? So that's assurance number one. So uh, uh, when you're discipling people, this, to me, I would suspect that this is fundamental. This is most fundamental, okay? This is the most fundamental assurance that we have, okay? Notice it's not works. Now, you'll study that our lifestyle, and we'll see later that our lifestyle is also an assurance. It can be an assurance of our salvation, but it's not most fundamental. Does everyone see that? It's not most fundamental. Um, if there is a religion, if there is a, if there is a, uh, a group, and they say the fundamental assurance is our works, <laughs> they're, they're completely wrong, okay? They're completely wrong. The, the most fundamental, the most fundamental assurance that we have is our union with Christ. Okay. Any comments or thoughts before we move on? Any comments or thoughts? Anyone want to add something? Uh, the union is an invitation from Christ. So it is he inviting us to be united with him. By faith. Yes, it's by faith. So it, the invitation comes from him first to us. Yes. Yes. Through his spirit. Through his spirit, specifically. The spirit working through the word of God. So therefore, we cannot come into Christ without his invitation to us. Yes, correct. Question, question are, all, are all people in this world invited to be united with Christ. Let's, let's, let's ask the question. Yeah. Are all people in this world uni uh, invited to be united with Christ? The answer would be yes. We would all say yes, right? I want a passage of scripture. Who could give me a passage of scripture where there's an invitation, uh, where there's an invitation to, to everyone? Um, there's a call for, for everyone to be uh, to repent and to put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Does anyone have a passage of scripture they want to share? Okay, let's let let us go to let us. I'll give us one. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give us one. Great question, Kuya Henry. Let's go to Mark. I'm leaving Romans. Imagine that. Well, uh, let let's go outside. I'll go to the. I'll go to a, a primary text because there's yeah. also in Romans. There's also in Romans, but. Let, let's, okay, go, let's go. Let's go. Uh, let's go outside Roman. Let's go to uh, Mark chapter one, verses fourteen and fifteen. So Mark chapter one, verses fourteen and fifteen. This is a. This was the. This was a fundamental. This was the fundamental message of Jesus Christ that was then continued by the apostles. Okay, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. There's, there's two call to actions here. Repent and believe. And then the question is, is there a limit to the audience? No, right? Well, it's, it's, it's an open proclamation. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe in the good news, okay? Without restriction, without qualification, uh, this, is, this is the fundamental message of Jesus, which then, which then the, the, the apostles continue. Now, I'm going to take this a step further. Let's go to one other passage. Let me first, uh, um, well, okay, we'll, we'll go to another passage uh, first, and then we'll go back and write that down. Let's go to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. This is, uh, I think it's verse, I think it's verse 30. This is when, when, when Paul is speaking in Athens with the, 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 the tomb of the unknown God. So listen to what he says. Now, a lot of times the word is just repent, but belief is presupposed in there. So when someone's talking about repent, repent is a change of mind. So 
so so when when there's a call to repent, it's 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 a call to to turn your mind and then to trust in in, in God. So we can talk about sometimes Jesus says in Matthew, it doesn't say he doesn't say repent and believe. He just says repent because of the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The belief is presupposed. Um, look here. Look, look, uh, look at what Paul says. Verse 30. Uh, we'll read verses 30 and 31, okay? The times of God's ignor the, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. So it's not even like uh, Kuya Henry said it's an invitation, and it is an invitation, but it's a command. <laughs> Stronger. <laughs> you, you, it's not as if, would you like to participate? Oh, it's okay if you don't. We're actually commanded. We're actually commanded. It's a command. Repent and believe is a command. That's why Paul will talk about the obedience of faith of, of the nations in Romans 1.5. Okay? So, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world. <laughs> so, this is the judgment we're talking about. This is the judgment in, in, in Romans. He will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And he has given, he has given assurance to all. So here's another, this is another assurance. Now of the judgment, not of, not of our salvation, but of the judgment. He's given assur assurance that this will happen by raising him from the dead. By raising him from the dead. So the raising Christ from the dead was an assurance of who he is what will happen in the, in the, in the last days, in, in the last of all days. Okay, so let's, let's go back to our passage. So we have here this, uh, um, it's a, uh, uh, in some places it's an invitation. So fair enough. So let's do both. It's an invitation. Pastor. Yes, go ahead. Pastor Ken. Go ahead. The, the, I think the problem there is that uh, it's like the parable of the sower. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, when the word of God falls on the on the heart yeah. of those who are not fertile, then they, they do not accept it. Yeah. But if it goes to the land which is fertile. You will see that the that the seedling seedling will grow. Mama. It's the same of the invitation. The invitation has been given to all about the Lord Jesus Christ, but some pulls on the heart, some pulls on the stony heart. Yeah. That's why it needs. I think it needs more prayer, so that these people who do not accept the Lord Jesus Christ. One day we'll come to know him. Yes, that, that's, that's, a, that's a very true statement. I agree with you, Pastor Noli. I agree with you on that. Um, because at the end of the day, to piggyback what Pastor Noli is saying, they're still under condemnation. It's only, those who, it's only those who are in Christ, in union with Christ, that are now free of condemnation, the final judgment. And, and so Pastor Henry is, is, is correct. There's this invitation, this call to be in union with Christ. He's inviting us. He's commanding us. In some places, it's an invitation. Other places, it's a command. Um, uh, good. Any other comments or, 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 or thoughts? The, the, the big point, I, I do want us to bring us back. The, the, big, the big point is that our assurance of salvation is grounded our, our assurance that we escape final judgment is grounded not in us, in Christ. It is not founded in us and what we do. It's founded in Christ. And only by our union, by our faith in Christ, do, is this verdict true for us. Okay? That's the big uh, point that I want to emphasize. Okay? What, what do you mean, Pastor? No more condemnation, no more no more damnation, no more judgment to those who are in Christ? Yes, yes. Uh, how can we explain the Hebrews 
which says that uh, for it is appointed unto man once to die and after that is judgment. The, the judgment is still in the future, okay? The judgment is still in the future and we will all, we will all still stand on judgment. But the profound truth, uh, Kuya Noli, is that that future verdict that future verdict has been brought back into the presence, into the present, when we are brought into union with Christ. Okay, because because that that judgment, the, the wrath of God was poured out on Christ. Um, the wrath which is coming in the future, He poured the wrath out on the cross. Diba? Yeah. Yeah. So, yes. So it's true that there's still another judge. The judgment has not yet happened, and we will all stand before the judgment. But what I'm trying to say is we are assured. We've been already told the verdict now. <laughs> That's what the point is. Yeah. And, it's, and it's more than just, it's, let me be clear. It's more than just saying, God saying, don't worry, Tim. I'll, I'll, give, I'll justify you. Don't worry, Tim. He's saying, you are, you are, you are. Okay, you are. Even though it has not yet happened, that's the most. It's the most profound thing. Think about the assurance. Think about the assurance. It's like you're going down to pay the bill, or you have a, a penalty that you have to pay at to, Tomeko. Tomeko. Right? You have the payment. You, you're guilty. Okay, and 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 you're going to go down there, but the judge calls you up and says, "Don't worry." I've already declared you innocent, but you still have to come. You still have to appear, but I've already, I've already, I've, we've already signed the papers. I've already, I've already slammed the gavel. You don't have to pay your fine. Just come down to the court with the, the rest of them. So you go down, you're standing in line, but you've already been told that the judgment has been nailed. That's the sense that that's, that's what is being stated here. That's the profound truth. That's, that's, that's so assuring and so assuring to us. Okay. Now, um, I'm not going to focus on verses two or three because we, we have to continue on. Our focus is assurances, assurances, okay? What I will just highlight for you is there is yet again uh, union uh, with Christ here. So that's a second statement. The law of the Spirit, which is life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. So so this is this is the connection here, okay? Um, you're going to be condemned, and you're going to be receive the punishment in prison, right? You've already been set free. <laughs> Did you see that? The law of the spirit, which is life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. So you've already been released, in a sense. Now there's truths now, both present and in the future. There's truths both now and in the future, but, but we've already been free. The, the judgment has been nailed. We've already escaped sin and death. And we are now uh, spiritually alive and, and, and spiritually part of the new heavens and the new earth. Okay? And then just to really bring this home, this is, everyone see this? He condemned in sin in the flesh, right? Uh, Sending his own son. Iba. So again, this is the judgment that we're talking about. So Christ on the cross took that final judgment payment that was owed to us. God's wrath was poured out upon him. So again, this is just explaining what's happening right now is, is Paul is explaining what's going on. The big point is the assurance, union with Christ, okay? I want you to focus on that. There's, there's other things being stated here. We, we don't have time to discuss all of them. The big point is our number one assurance, union with Christ, okay? If I was giving you a test, what is our number one assurance? What is the most foundational assurance? Union with Christ, okay? Let's continue on here. Uh, verse 4. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Okay? So that here we have this description. Okay? We have this description here that's describing us. Okay? So if you can look up here, 
This is description number one. Here's description number two. Does everyone see that here? So those who have no condemnation are number one, those who are in Christ. Okay? Number one description. But here now, you have, you have, a, right? you, you, you have a restatement, but now the description is, is what? What is a what is some what is a benefit? What is a requirement of those who are in Christ? Those who walk according, uh, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Does everyone see that there? So the number one description is that we're in Christ. The number two description is that we walk according to the Spirit. Okay. So this seems to be the beginning of a second assurance, <laughs> a second either confirmation or maybe uh, uh, warning. You know, are you, are you truly in Christ? Are you truly by faith in Christ? Okay, so look at verse 5 and 6. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. So what's going to happen here is this is now an explanation. This is an explanation. Uh, those who live according to the flesh, what do, what do those who are, how can we determine who it is, uh, people who are um, walking according to the flesh, walking according to the spirit? Well, the action is they set their minds on the things of the flesh. What is, where is their mind focused? The flesh. Contrast those who live according to the spirit. So, so, so we have this description. This is number two. They're walking. Here it's now living. What's another way of saying living according to the spirit? We've already studied it. What's another way of saying living according to the spirit? We've already studied, for, studied it from last week or two weeks ago. Queen Henry, I know you know it. You're going to say it. Lifestyle. Okay, lifestyle. But what was the specific statement in the passage that we studied? Go ahead. Uh, there is freedom. No, yeah, there is freedom in the spirit. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, from last week, we were studying in Romans chapter 1, verses... Uh, 15, 16, I think, in, uh, or 16 and 17. It's almost the same wording, who live according to the Spirit. What was the statement? In, someone look up Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Live, the righteous shall live by faith, right? <laughs> right? Does everyone see that? Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Righteous. The righteous shall live by faith. These statements are complementary. Um, living by faith, living according to spirit. I mean, they're, they're, they're complementary ideas. So this is what it means to, this is what it means to, so someone can say, well, I'm, I'm righteous because I live by faith, but their works are terrible. <laughs> no, you can't. It's, it's contradictory. You can't say you're, you're living by faith and going out and living like the devil. And, and Romans chapter 8 is, is further clarifying, further describing what it means to live by faith. So it's not, it's not faith against works in, this, in, in the Christian life, right? It's, it's uh, the outworking of faith, the outworking of the Holy Spirit is, is work. So let, 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 let's look at this here for a second. So if, let's just imagine internally. Internally, you have faith. Internally, internally you have spirit is, is in and then the outworking of this is works. But it's the works of the Spirit. <laughs> Everyone tracking with me there? The works are the product. So we could say works are the product of union with Christ. 
not the cause. <laughs> Works are the product of justification, not the cause. Does everyone see what I'm saying there? Uh, our works do not justify us. They're not the basis of our justification, but the product of what has already happened to us. Everyone tracking with me? Let me take a step back, ask a question. I want to make sure everyone's tracking with what I'm saying. So just to repeat, um, works, people will say, well, my, my, I'm a good person, and you know, God's going to outweigh my works. No, that's not true. Um, when, all the, when all the works are judged, we all fall short. Um, but it's wrong to say that, oh, I live by faith regardless of whether I have works, regardless of whether there's works or not. What's being stated here is that, is that this walking in the spirit and not according to the flesh is actually doing good, uh, doing what is right. Is everyone tracking with me? Kuya Henry, do you want to ask a question or make a comment? Or does it make sense? What I'm saying is, I just want to be clear that I'm making sense. I don't want to be confusing. Am I, is everyone tracking with what I'm saying here? Okay, I'm going to go ahead. Go ahead, Henry. Go ahead. The first one, chapter 1, verse 16, 17, and 17, for the righteousness. Um, verse 17 say, for uh, the righteousness shall live by faith, okay? As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Yeah. Now, in Romans 8, verse 5, part B, those who live according to the Spirit sets their mind on the things of the Spirit. So I want to find the connection, the righteousness. Yeah. So I just live by faith and the Spirit. Yeah, yeah so what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that you have, they're, they're complementary. Do you understand complementary ideas? Uh, what I'm trying to say is the righteous shall live by faith is not comprehensive. The, 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 those who live according, they're complement, both have to be present is what I'm trying to say. What, what I'm trying to say is that someone could say, I'm righteous because I live by faith but then their physical works do not match the claim that they have faith. And what I'm saying is, no, 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 no. What we're starting to see here is that, what does it mean to live by faith? Well, you live according to the Spirit. You see what I'm saying? Uh, it's, it's giving a fuller picture. It's giving a fuller picture of what it means to live by faith. That's what I'm trying to say. Does that make sense, Kuya Henry, what I'm, what I'm trying to say? Yeah, okay, good. All right. Um, uh, how about this? Because, because maybe some of these concepts, they're deep, okay? I, if, if you have a question, discuss in your small group, and let's, let's think about that. Maybe I'll post a, a, this question to think about. I want us to see what I'm trying to get at is that people will, will hide behind their faith or statements about faith as a, as a justification for them to continue to live in sin. And what I'm trying to say is that, is that the Word of God here is saying no, um, there's no mention of faith yet in this passage, Diva, but Romans 1 has said the righteous shall live by faith. So, so we can, we, uh, where it's presupposed is in this union with Christ. It's understood, as Henry said, those who by faith are in union with Christ. Henry said it. So when you say those who are in Christ, you're, you're assuming by faith. Okay, you're assuming by faith. All right, so let's go on here. So, so positively now, um, those who set their minds, uh, there are those uh, who set their minds on the things of the Spirit, okay? So right now what's happening here is there's a contrast. There's a contrast. So it's more than just saying we're in union with Christ. There's, there's more assurance. There's a... There's a double check. There's a double check. Does everyone see that? If we're saying, if we're saying, uh, if we're saying that this is true, if this is true, then so is this, and so is this. Okay. Everyone's tracking with me here. Watch. For to set your mind, verse six. For to set your mind 
on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So someone can, this is, this is a second assurance and a warning. Someone cannot claim to be in union with Christ, but focusing their mind on the flesh. Because someone who is focusing their mind on their flesh, they do not please God, okay? Look at this, watch this. You, however, are not in the flesh, but are in, but are in the spirit. If in fact, so what is this saying here? If in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. So let's, 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 draw, let's try to draw this out, okay? So what he's saying here is that um, if the Spirit of, so let's just start here, okay? Let, let's, let's come out here. I want to try to draw this out pictorially. So the statement is uh, no condemnation for those in union with Christ. Correct? Number one. Does everyone agree with that? Tama, right? Number two. Number two, we have here those who are walking according to to the spirit. Number two, who are these people? They walk according to the spirit. Number three, well, how do we know what Paul is saying, well, how do, how do we know this? Well, because their minds are set on the Spirit. Number four, Spirit dwells in them. Does everyone see that? So I'm, re I'm rewording what his argument is. Let, let me bring this over because I want to put the contrast up here. So I'm going to bring this over here. Just bear with me here for a second. What the, art, what the author is saying is this. So does everyone see what I'm saying here? Does everyone see what's being, what, what, the, what Paul is saying is that, number one, there's no condemnation for those who are in union with Christ. Number two, they walk according to the Spirit. How, why are they walking according to the Spirit? Because their minds are set on the Spirit. Well, how do we know their minds are set on the Spirit? Because the Spirit dwells within them. Do you see what I'm saying? Someone who says, uh, someone who is walking in accord with the Spirit, Someone who is walking according to the Spirit cannot walk according to the flesh. Well, well, why can they not walk according to the flesh? Because the flesh is hostile to God. Well, why? Because the Spirit then does not dwell. Does everyone see that? So what's, what's, what's happening here is that, what's happening here is this. Let's, let's reword this again, okay? So that's the argument, but let's, let's go ahead and let's do one more just to make this super clear, okay? 
our number one assurance is union with Christ. The benefit of union with Christ is dwelling of Holy Spirit. The dwelling of the Holy Spirit leads to setting mind on things of spirit. The setting of the mind on the things of the spirit leads to number four, walking according to the spirit. Does everyone track with me now? Does that make sense? This is what Paul is saying. This is essentially what Paul is saying. I'm just rewording it. No condemnation for those who are in union with Christ. Those who are in union with Christ, the Holy Spirit is dwelling within them. I'm, I'm going the opposite way now. He, he was going into causes. Causes, I'm going into inferences. Okay, so I'm going the opposite direction in the argument. Okay, so Paul is saying, Union with Christ, why? Because they, they walk according to the Spirit. Why? Because they, they have set their minds according to the Spirit. Why? Because the Spirit dwells within them. Okay, so I'm, I'm going the opposite direction in his argumentation. Those who are, have union with Christ, one of the benefits of union with Christ is the dwelling of the Holy Spirit. What's the result of dwelling of the Holy Spirit? You set your minds on the thing of the Spirit. What's the result of setting your mind on the Spirit? Walking according to the Spirit. Does everyone, is everyone really tracking with what I'm saying here? Okay. So what we have here is these are what, uh, these are all assurances. One, two, three, four. So everyone is, everyone is tracking with me here. Okay. So this is Paul's argument. Okay. Um, there are, there are consequences to our salvation is what he's making the argument. Okay. And we talked about, this comes back to pastor Pat, uh, Kuya Henry's comment in Romans chapter one, Paul was transformed by the power of God in his experience. And in the same way, when we experience saving faith, when we experience, when we accept this invitation, we're transformed, we experience this, this resurrection power, we are different. Our fundamental assurance is union with Christ, but then these other things also give us assurance. If my lifestyle is walking according to the flesh every day and I'm committing all these sins, I should wonder if I'm actually in union with Christ. If my mind is full of, now that's not to say that we don't struggle. I'm, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that we're perfect. There's no one's perfect. But if your life stop, if your life is more is more descriptive of the flesh than the spirit, it's a problem. Okay, um, uh, if our minds are always focused on physical things, on the flesh, on carnal things, on sinful things, that should cause pause. Are you in the, Are you in union with Christ? If your mind is focused on heavenly things, it is focused on spiritual things. That's an assurance. That's an assurance to us. If you're interested in spiritual things, if other people are interested in spiritual things, okay? The dwelling of the Holy Spirit, we're going to see later, he testifies to us, is an assurance, okay? So what I want us to at least, what I want us to at least see up until this point is that um, Paul is making an argument for, for assurance of our salvation. And right now we have, we have four, okay? All right? And maybe he's going to come back to some of these. But the most foundational, the absolute most foundational is union with Christ. Okay? Let's continue here if there's no more questions. Look at this. Watch this. Verse number 10. Um, but if Christ is in you, he doesn't say the Spirit, but if Christ, uh, think about that. This is equated to Christ. This is just like, a, this is a nugget. This is an extra nugget for you. I'm sorry. Uh, um, but if Christ is in you, 
although the body is dead because of sin, which we still have the sinful body, we have not yet received the resurrection, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from, from the dead dwells with you, so again, this reference to dwelling, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So again, this dwelling of the spirit is this assurance of salvation. Okay? Look at this now. Verse 12. So then, brothers, we are, not, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. This is not just physical death. This is eternal death. Does this mean that we have a works-based salvation? No. We've already proven uh, walking according to the flesh is just a sign that you don't have union with Christ. You see that? You see what's going on there? So in a lot of cases, it's these claims to, it's a misunderstanding. They're not looking at the full picture. If, if you're walking according to the flesh, someone who, is, someone who truly has a union with Christ, has the spirit, cannot live a lifestyle of walking according to the flesh. Okay? Coming back here. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So this, this here, this is sanctification. <laughs> the mortification of the flesh. Uh, other places, put off the old man, put on the new man right? The fruits of the Spirit. Do not practice the works of the flesh. Practice the, work, the, the fruits of the Spirit. Watch this. Watch this, okay? For all who are led, for all who are led by the Spirit are sons of God. Is this not another statement of, of, of Walking by the Spirit, Tamaba. That's another way of saying walking by the Spirit. We've already seen that. We've already seen that um, right here, walking according to the Spirit earlier, right? So these are assurances for us. Most fundamental, union with Christ. If you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into, but you received the spirit of adoption of sons, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Watch this. Now here is a fifth assurance. The actor is the spirit. The action is bearing witness. So the spirit is bearing witness with our spirit. So it's speaking to us, telling us that we are children of God. Does everyone see that there? Let's take a, let's take a moment to think about that. So there is an inward testimony of the spirit that speaks to us. So we have five assurances. Do we have warnings? Are there warnings? Within the context of assurance, is there warnings? We have at least, uh, at least two, Diva. The, the, the warnings are setting our mind, setting our mind on the flesh, and also walking in the flesh. Okay, so let's, let's write out the two warnings here, okay?
So far we have five assurances and we have two warnings. And the warnings are good because they keep us in check. Okay, they keep us in check. Now, let's go ahead, um, let's go ahead and let's jump to, let's jump to uh, verse 31. Okay, we're jumping now to verse 31. There's so much more here. I do want to finish tonight. So, um, you know, we can talk about being fellow heirs with God and Christ, and it's so amazing. There's more assurances in the middle of verses 18 to 30, but we just don't have the time. So actually, you could do that. You could study, you could study verses 18 to 30 um, on your own time. Well, let's go now to, to verse 31. Um, so, th so it's just building towards this climax. It's building towards a climax. So I'm, I'm, I'm skipping to the climax. I'm skipping to the end of Infinity Wars <laughs> to see the end battle. <laughs> um, uh, we have this question here, okay? We have this question. We have several questions here. Uh, this, is a, this is a rhetorical question. Number one, rhetorical question number two. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? What is so profound there? Looking at our study so far in the book of Romans, what is our primary problem? What is the primary problem? Let's take a moment to think here. What is our primary problem in the book of Romans? Is it Satan? It's the flesh. It's the flesh. The primary problem is the flesh, okay? Problems, right? So we have problems. Uh, the flesh. What else? What else is our problem in connection with the flesh? Anyone? The mind. Okay, the mind, yes. So, so... Um, yes, the mind. Uh, what else? What, what do these things produce? What's, what's the specific thing? What's the specific thing that makes all this a problem? What's the result of the flesh and the mind? Sin. Sin. And, and what does sin bring? According to the gospel. Bring condemnation to us. Condemnation, specifically wrath of God, Diba, the wrath of God. We have condemnation and the wrath of God. Okay. So, in in the gospel, the primary issue is not Satan. The primary issue is not demons. The primary issue is not social issues. The primary issue is not um, lack of money, lack of material. Our primary problem is our sin, our sin nature, our mind that's sinful, our actions that are sinful, and that's bringing the wrath of God. So the primary problem is wrath of God. But if God is for us, do we have any problems? If, if that's our biggest problem and God is for us, who can be against us? Does everyone see that what, what he's saying here? It's, it's not really a question. It's like if our biggest problem is God, but if he's for us, who can, who, can bring him, who can be against us? Think about that. This, if I was to rephrase this, no one is against us in actuality. You see what I'm saying? That's another way of saying it. No one's against us. There's no one, of course, Satan's against us, but, but, but it's, it's like, it's peanuts, it's peanuts, it's small, it's small. <laughs> uh, centavos, centavos. <laughs> watch, watch. How do we know? How do we know that God is for us? If he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not with him graciously give us all things? Union with Christ. Union with Christ. Christ gave him up for us, with, uh, with him. This is union with Christ.
if God gave us Christ when we were his enemies, what do you think he's going to do when we're his friends? Think. This is the assurance. This comes back to the assurance number one. This comes back to assurance number one. Union with Christ. If we get through I-team, and I ask you, what's your number one assurance? And you do not tell me union with Christ. I will not give you the certificate. I will personally, I will personally call up Cyril and say, if you give him that certificate, I, I'm going to burn it. I want you to understand union with Christ. That's our hope. That's our everything. Okay. That is our assurance. Watch. Now we're going back. A charge. A charge. Who shall bring a charge? <laughs> so now we're back to judgment. This is judgment. This is judgment context. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is to condemn? There's no, there's no one. The, the, Satan can make a charge. It doesn't matter. We have Christ. Watch this. So watch this. Who can condemn? It's more than that. It's more, it's more than, than God giving us Christ. Uh, Christ is the one who died. This, let's look at description here. Description. Uh, number one. Christ died. More than that. Christ is raised. Number two. Uh, you can say description, or maybe you want to say this assurance. I don't know. Maybe the assurance. assurances. Christ died. This is the gospel. Remember, we said this is First Corinthians fifteen. In this we stand. We are being saved. We hold fast to that. Christ died in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried and rose again for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That he was raised. Watch this. Number three. He's at the right hand for, he's interceding for us. Earlier in Romans, we saw the spirit is interceding for us. I think actually that's in Romans uh, 17 to 30. We missed that. I'm sorry. We didn't have the time. But, but God's not going to judge us. But if you had a doubt, if you had a doubt that God was going to still judge us, we have his son who died for us, rose again. He's at his right hand, and he's interceding for us. This is another assurance. And, I mean, this is coming back to union with Christ, but this is what Christ, you can even talk about. This is what, this is what God, uh, God did, does, right? Christ did, does, will do. <laughs> will do. Will do. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who can do it? Will it be tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword? As is written, all, we're experiencing all these bad things. No, no, we are more than conquerors. Now, let me just, Henry, Henry, you should know this. Uh, uh, it's a different word. Um, You'll, you'll, you'll see it when I say it. Okay, so the, the, the Greek word here, I would, we did a, we did a, we're doing a study in, 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 in David's prayer of confession. And, and David, in his prayer of confession, he prays, he's confessing his sin and the purpose for confessing his sin so that God would be justified, that he would uh, overcome, he would overcome in judgment because God was meeting out the judgment he, he would be the one meeting out the judgment. Do you buy Henry? So this word here, I don't like this word. This is, this should be uh, more, right in your Bibles. More than uh, overcoming. Uh, super overcoming. <laughs> we overcome. We overcome in judgment. Because of all these things that are for us, 
what he's saying here is that we, in, in all these things, we are more than overcoming in the judgment through him who loved us. For I am sure, I am sure, I am sure, I am sure, I am sure. So I am sure, this is assurance, assurance. Now, now he's going to say certain things. What is the assurance? Neither death, uh, death nor life, angels or rulers, things present, things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor anything else in creation. So when you have a list like this, it's, re it's, it's redundant. It's ridiculous because he's trying to say that there is, there is a 1,000% uh, guarantee. Nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God because of our works. Does it say because of our works there? Does it say that? What does it say? What does it say? In Christ Jesus our Lord. If you haven't heard it tonight, if you have not heard it tonight, I will say it again, union with Christ. So, the sure thing, I team chapter two, I team chapter two. Number one assurance that we will overcome, over overcome in the judgment, union with Christ. Number one. Number two. The Spirit is dwelling with, uh, within us. Number three, our, our, the Spirit, uh, sorry, uh, the Spirit is dwelling with us. Number three, our minds are set on spiritual things. So if we are thinking spiritual thoughts, we are growing in grace, we are focused on spiritual things. That's our third assurance. Number four, walking by faith or in accordance with the Holy Spirit. So living a holy life, which is by faith in accordance with the Holy Spirit and, and, and putting to death the deeds of the flesh. So coming back up here, I do want to highlight this. Um, uh, putting to death deeds of the flesh in the body. That is also an assurance. This is also an assurance here. Okay. Um, so that's like, five, I think, four or five. Putting the deeds. And then the Spirit bearing witness for us. The spirit bearing witness for us is it yet another assurance. Okay. So there's at least six different assurances here. And going back to the fundamental thing, if we are in union with Christ, God is for us. If we are in union with Christ, the Holy Spirit is interceding for us. If we are in union with Christ, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. So what I want you to see here tonight, today, is that um, uh, salvation is guaranteed. It's sure. It's not, it's not on our basis. Our good works are the result, not the basis of the final verdict. Okay? The, I'm going to speak blunt. The Catholic Church does not teach this. Some, some uh, evangelicals do not teach this. Iglesia Ni Christa does not teach this. We are justified solely on the basis of union with Christ, by faith in him. Okay? And then everything is the consequence. But it's a necessary consequence. It's a necessary consequence. Just like the fruit, the fruit on the mango tree is the consequence of the seed that you plant, so the fruit of the Spirit, walking by the Spirit, is the natural end result of union with Christ. Okay? What time is it right now? Did I make it? We, we made it. So let's just have a moment to talk. Anyone can make a comment, can share. Um, maybe this was a rush. I hope it was understandable. Um, maybe Pastor Noli or, or if pa Pastor, Pastor June or Pastor Henry, if you want to add, if something was confusing, um, I, I hope it was clear. Um, uh, this is so foundational for us. I'll go ahead and open the floor to anyone who wants to make a comment. Yeah, it's clear, King. It's clear. It's clear. It's powerful. It, it, 
you know, even when I was reading, you get goosebumps. It's like when you, when we just read the word of God with that, I, I will, I will say this. If, if we, if we can get to a place as all of us where we just read the word of God, I want to encourage you tonight. When, when you're preparing sermons, when you're preparing, when you're preparing, uh, when you're preparing, um, Bible studies, lessons, go, go to the Word of God without a topic. Go to the Word of God without a preconceived. Let the Word of God speak to you. Let the Word of God be your guide. Um, if, we, if, we go, if we go to the Word of God with a, a topic or a preconception in mind, we try to force that into the text, and it doesn't always make sense. If we just read the Word and just let it, come up. It's so powerful. So powerful. Okay, it's late. So if there's no comments or, 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 or questions, Pastor Noli, can you close us in a word of prayer, please? Okay. Okay. We'll pray. Thank you, Lord, for the decision that uh, we have made this night. Bless each and every one of us. Lord, we pray for the words that we have uh, studied today, put in our hearts and in our minds. And as Pastor Noli was praying, Father God, I just ask that we would, we would meditate upon these great truths, as he said, the, um, the truth that we are in union with, with, with your Son, and that's the only way that we can escape judgment. Father God, I pray, though, that the other assurances would also speak to our hearts, that we would have our minds set on, on, on spiritual things, that, the, that we would be putting to death the deeds of the flesh, that we, we would be walking according to the Spirit, and walking according to the Spirit, Father God, it's by faith. And so, Father God, I just ask that as we go here tonight, that you can strengthen and encourage us. May we, um, may we serve uh, your, your, the, the communities that we're, we're ministering. May we... May we uh, Proclaim the word of God. And Father, I just ask that our lives would be um, uh, lives of, of, of being an example of, of the gospel, Father God, that people would look at us and they would see Christ. I just ask for you to, to bless everyone tonight, bless their ministries, provide for them if there's a need, uh, heal those who are sick, and we ask for your will to be done. It's in Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things, Father.